Hi, my name is Professor Kara Roberts and I'm the professor for the Naturalization and Citizenship Clinic here at Florida Coastal School of Law. Uh, this presentation is for Volunteers of Citizenship Day and you have kindly offered to volunteer and so we're giving this presentation so that you're aware of everything you need to know before April 15th. Let's get started. So what we'll go over today is what is Citizenship Day, confidentiality of client and applicant information, the difference between form filling, uh, giving information and legal advice, uh, appropriate use and behavior of interpreters, the proper dress and etiquette at Citizenship Day, multiculturalism and sensitivity to varying cultures, as well as uh, the flow of the event and the responsibilities at every station. So what is Citizenship Day? Citizenship Day is a nationwide event that helps potential applicants determine their eligibility and fill out N-400 applications for U.S. citizenship. In Jacksonville, the event is primarily sponsored by the American Immigration Lawyers Association and Florida Coastal School of Law. There's also additional support from Jacksonville Area Legal Aid and NALEO, who provides all the study materials for the event, and numerous other ones across the nation. It's a free event that is completely open to the public. The only uh, fees for clients or applicants are the application fees associated with filing for U.S. citizenship. So the purpose is to assist lawful permanent residents in the U.S. For, uh, to apply with U.S. citizenship. And the goal is to help them apply with naturalization, that's the way that they become U.S. citizens, um, or help them get the help that they need if they have any barriers to overcome, such as somebody who has mm, medical issues that prevent them from learning English and might need a medical waiver of the test. And usually you need an attorney's help, so we would do a pro bono referral. Um, or if they had some other minor issues that may create some kind of problem for them and need additional research, then it might be a case appropriate for, again, a pro bono referral so an attorney can conduct research for them. So what are the benefits of becoming a U.S. citizen? Naturalization is key to civic participation. That's how you can vote. That's the most important aspect uh, of the civic participation when you become a U.S. citizen. That's what most people want when they become a U.S. citizen. Um, they obtain the right to vote and they have their civic responsibilities. Um, increased employment opportunities because now you have the ability to work for the federal government in higher levels of security. Um, obtain a U.S. passport and travel more easily. Uh, petition for family members. And having the power to make a difference in your community. So who can become a U.S. citizen? Anyone who wants to apply for U.S. citizenship must have a green card. They must be a permanent, a lawful permanent resident, LPR. And there's many ways that people get green cards. Uh, most people are familiar with family-based petitions, and that's one way to have a family member who's already here um, file a petition for you and then sponsor you to come to the United, to the United States. There's also employment petitions where an employer um, will, you know, sponsor you um, for a specific job or purpose and that sometimes can turn into a green card. Um, there's also refugees and asylees, so people who come to the United States seeking refuge in, uh, from persecution. And these are all the basis, not all of them, but some of the basis for getting a green card. Um, but no matter how you get the green card, you must have that before you can apply for U.S. citizenship. And in most circumstances, a person must have at least five years of permanent residency before they can apply for U.S. citizenship. They can apply three months early, so you might see some applicants who are less than five years, um, but within three months, and that's why they're allowed to come to Citizenship Day. The other option is uh, if you've been married to a U.S. citizen for three years and had your green card for those three years. So you have to have the marriage for the full three years to the same person, and you have to have your green card for that same period. It does not matter how you got the green card, just as long as the person meets that criteria. And so this is the general... These are the kinds of people that you will see at Citizenship Day, people who have had their green cards and either for three years with a U.S. citizen spouse or for five years on their own. So the requirements for U.S. citizenship, they have to be at least 18 years old, uh, so no minors can apply. Um, they have to have their green card, again, for at least five years unless married to a U.S. citizen. And the physical, and physical presence and continuous residency, basically they have to... Uh, be physically present in the United States for half of the last five years or three years if, if based on marriage to a U.S. citizen. Um, and they have to continue to reside in the United States. This means that they can still travel, but they have to maintain their permanent residence in the United States. So they have a home here, they have an apartment, something they lease, they have a job, or they just have other ties to the United States that prove that they still live here. So it's okay for them to travel in the interim in case you're wondering about that. Um, good moral character has to be proven, and this is a big, big, complex area of immigration law, and so we'll just leave it at that, that they have to establish good moral character. Um, they need to be able to speak and understand and read and write in English, and it just has to be basic English. 
Um, don't be surprised if you see some people at Citizenship Day who appear to have weak English or may seem as though they might not be able to pass a test. Um, just because they behave that way at Citizenship Day does not mean that they cannot study and accomplish the goal of being able to pass by the time they have an interview. And sometimes just having a case pending is what will help them give that little nudge so that they actually do it and accomplish the goal. Um, knowledge of U.S. history and civics, again, that's what most people think of when they think of the citizenship test, and that's the hundred possible questions, and they'll be asked ten out of the hundred. A random ten will be selected. Um, and then willingness to take the oath of the, uh, the, the oath to become a U.S. citizen. So the swearing-in ceremony, they have to be willing and able to take the oath. And there are some exceptions to all of this that the volunteer attorneys um, have been trained on and will be able to determine you know, and ensure that people are eligible. I just want to make sure that you're familiar with the criteria. Um, there is also an application fee of $725, and that is necessary to pay unless they qualify for a fee waiver. And so there's only, there's actually a, an option for a partial fee waiver. We won't be doing that at Citizenship Day because it's a little complicated, um, but we will be offering certain types of full fee waivers for clients. And so if we have clients who meet the criteria for either having, uh, they're receiving federal means-tested public benefits or they are low income according to their tax returns, then we'll do a fee waiver. And basically, you complete a form, it's an I-912, you check the boxes that indicate what kind of fee waiver it is, you provide the information in the form, and then you attach the evidence. Um, and once immigration takes a look at it, then they'll either approve or reject it and ask them, you know, if they approve it, then the client will get a notice saying that they have a case pending and they didn't pay a fee. If they reject it, they send the application back so that the client can try to submit another fee waiver with additional evidence if necessary or to submit the fee. So your duties as a volunteer. On Citizenship Day, um, you'll be involved in a large event providing legal services to, and advice to applicants for U.S. citizenship. Volunteer attorneys will be present to provide the legal advice. Volunteer students, that's you, uh, will be present to assist with application preparations, such as form filling, copying, um, and basically ad hoc errands as needed, and there are always plenty at Citizenship Day. Um, you'll assist clients and applicants with proceeding from station to station. Um, and, and when necessary, if any of you are available to interpret and have interpreting abilities, um, we may ask you to help interpret for some clients. Uh, and this may seem to contradict the criteria for citizenship about being able to speak and understand English, but that's because there are exceptions to that, and some of our clients will qualify for the exceptions and absolutely can use an interpreter. So confidentiality of client and applicant information. Attorneys are governed by model rules of professional conduct, as you know, and as you all either have already taken the MPRE or will be preparing to do so. And so I do not doubt that you are familiar with this rule or you will be very, very soon, like now. So confidentiality of information. Basically, you should not reveal information relating to representation of a client unless they tell you it is okay to reveal. Um, the fundamental principle in the client-lawyer relationship is that the lawyer maintain confidentiality of information relating to the representation. The client is thereby encouraged to communicate fully and frankly with the lawyer even as to embarrassing or legally damaging subject matter. This is important for Citizenship Day because the issues that usually cause problems for clients are potential criminal issues. And so you want them to feel comfortable enough to tell you about everything in their history so that you have solid facts, and you can give solid advice based on that. And so the only time that you are required to disclose information that technically is confidential is to prevent a client from committing a crime or to prevent a death or substantial bodily harm to another. And so these are the only two circumstances that absolutely require disclosure. And then there are circumstances that allow for disclosure but don't require it. Um, and I will let you read through those at your leisure. Um, that just gives you an idea of what circumstances allow you to share information. Um, this is important because it's Citizenship Day. Again, it's a large event, and you want, even though it is very open, even though people can hear things when it comes to certain types of information, you want to try and keep it as private as possible. Um, you just want to make sure that people are comfortable. If there's, if you can see concern on someone's face about something being too public, you see that maybe they have something they want to share, but there's too many people around, then it's okay to create 
you know, find out if there's some way to meet with them in private. Find out if we can have a separate room and we can make them comfortable. We want to make sure that we help all clients at Citizenship Day. We want to make sure that we do a good job uh, of getting good information and good facts for cases. So privilege versus confidentiality. Privilege is what allows you to not have to reveal information when you are in some kind of judicial proceeding. Confidentiality is much broader and that applies to matters communicated in confidence by the client and all information relating to representation regardless of the source. So with confidentiality, your resp responsibilities regarding a non-lawyer assistant and for Citizenship Day, that's you guys again. Um, is a person who uses the title paralegal, legal assistant, or other similar term when offering or providing services must work under the direction of, under the direction or supervision of a lawyer. So that's why we have the volunteer attorneys um, at Citizenship Day. And so you'll be working under the supervision of those attorneys and me, Professor Roberts. So volunteers must abide by the same rules of professional conduct and you have to keep communications with clients confidential. And this is very important, the difference between form filling, giving information, and giving legal advice. So form filling is inserting factual information in blank sections of a form. The unlicensed practice of law is assistance in the provision, selection, and completion of legal forms. So what's the distinction between form filling and unlicensed practice of law? When you tell a client what forms need to be completed and what information should be provided, you are providing legal advice. If you are simply putting information that they give you into a form, you are form filling. So with form filling, you gather necessary information and complete forms. And this can be performed by anybody. But then the non-lawyer, again, must transcribe the information exactly as provided. You can't add information, you can't delete, can't correct, and you can't comment. And that's a pretty tricky area. So with immigration, also USCIS is immigration, but most people just call it immigration, former INS and that's United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, they also bring awareness to the difference between form filling and legal advice. And so again, with form filling, you need help writing in answers to questions. You can get this type of information from anyone, and it shouldn't cost you much, but you're also not getting advice. Legal advice uh, is when you're not sure what benefit to apply for, what information to put in a form, what options you have, what the consequences may be. Then you're diving into the area of legal advice. And so what is legal information? And that's telling someone how to do something. Factual and generic, it doesn't suggest a particular course of action. Examples are where to find forms, what are the immigration laws, and what does USCIS mean? And non-lawyers, again, can provide legal information but cannot provide legal advice. Uh, the best way that, the best example I can give in terms of the difference between legal advice and providing legal information or even form filling is legal information is telling somebody how to do something. Uh, legal advice is telling them whether they should. Um, and that usually helps to clarify whether or not you're diving into that realm. So again, legal advice, telling them what to do, legal information, just telling them how to do it. So the practice of law, if we can just get this in your head, we really don't want you to lose licenses before you get them. Please do not give legal advice at Citizenship Day unless it is directly under the supervision of an attorney or at the direction of an attorney. Um, the practice of law is the application of legal principles and judgment with regard to the circumstances or objectives of a person that requires the knowledge and skill of a person trained in law. If the activity requires the independent judgment and participation of a lawyer, it cannot be properly delegated to a non-lawyer employee. So recommending a course of action or applying the law to a client's situation would be the practice of law and that should only be done by the attorneys. So more examples of practice of law, preparing legal documents for others, especially when you are deciding what forms to use, when you are deciding what information goes in, um, accepting attorney's fees, that would be pretty obvious, uh, appearing as a legal representative, calling yourself a lawyer, sending correspondence as the legal representative of a client regarding legal matters, giving advice regarding the filling out of forms, threatening to file a lawsuit, or giving advice about rights or consequences of certain actions. Let's go into appropriate use and behavior of an interpreter. So there are some clients who have limited or no English abilities and will require the assistance of interpreter. Um, again, don't be surprised when you see people at Citizenship Day who may not be fully fluent in English and may be using an interpreter. 
Um, there are exceptions to the English requirement. Many of our clients meet the exception, or there are some clients who maybe are just more comfortable with their foreign language and wish to get their application prepared that way, um, but will be okay by the time of interview and testing. And so just be aware that there is nothing wrong with some of our clients using interpreters. Um, when using an interpreter, if you're a volunteer and you find a need that you need an interpreter, just make sure that when you use an interpreter that you are still speaking to the client. You make eye contact with the client. Um, that's the whole point, is you're having a conversation with that person, and so you want to make sure that you are speaking as though the conversation is flowing that way. Uh, you don't want to look at somebody and go, hey, can you tell them that I said this? Because that's not how you would normally speak to somebody. You would just say, like you were talking to the actual client, and you look at them, and you have your interpreter on the side. They don't exist. They're just this machine, this box to your left or right, that is taking one language and spitting out another for you so that you know what's going on. Um, and that way you have a normal conversation. But if you are an interpreter, uh, that is what you need to know, is that you need to interpret exactly. You don't need to say he said or she said. You say exactly what is going on so that it sounds like a normal conversation to both parties. Um, and realize that you are an incredibly useful tool to clients and other volunteers, so strive to be the best tool that you can be. Uh, also, as a side note, and Professor Erica Coran is the one who told me this when I was a student here, that when it involves documents, it's translating, when it involves uh, conversation, it's interpreting. And now you're going to be annoyed every time somebody uses the wrong word, and I'm really sorry, but they will be used interchangeably everywhere in your life, and now you know, and now it's going to bother you. So I apologize, that's all my fault. Again, with eye contact with the interpreters, make sure you're looking at the client just treat the interpreter like a machine, this thing on the side, your tool to figure out what this person is saying to you, and vice versa. Um, you want to make sure that your client feels as though they are talking to you. You want to make sure that the immigrant feels as though they are being spoken to directly, um, and not that the interpreter is the one that they are getting advice from, getting information from. And so keep an eye out for uncertainty and confusion. If you see um, clients going around Citizenship Day and they don't seem to really, they seem hesitant, um, go ahead and approach them and see what kind of help they need if they understand what's going on. Um, if, again, you're using an interpreter in this situation and you're getting this look on their face or you have this feeling that it's not quite effective, ask Again, it's okay to ask questions multiple times. It's okay to be redundant. It's okay um, to be sure. And if sometimes you question whether interpreting is being done properly, it's okay to get a second opinion and say, you know, maybe we should try somebody else just in case, just to be sure. Um, and for interpreters, that is not to be offensive towards you. Um, that is, again, to just make sure that we take care of our clients and that we have good, solid, factual information to base our research and our advice on. Um, when you are interpreting or when you are using an interpreter, you want to keep side conversations to an absolute minimum. Um, and basically, you don't want to have any side conversations. Or if you do, you should let the client know that's what you're doing. Um, hey, interpreter, can you let the client know we're going to discuss this real quick so that we can try to explain to them. You know, whatever the situation is, you just want to make sure that all parties are aware of what's going on so you don't have somebody in the dark wondering, especially the person who doesn't speak English. <laughs> Proper dress and etiquette at Citizenship Day. It is our 10th annual Citizenship Day. That's a big deal. Um, it's a decade of helping people become US citizens, and that is a wonderful feeling. And so because of this glorious event, we are asking that you come in proper attire, and that would be business professional. Uh, even I will don a suit or business professional attire of some kind, and I'm very much against that mostly, most of the time. So. Even I will put on a suit, and I hope you will too, because you have to. Things not to wear, please don't come in your beach gear, please don't come in cargo shorts, as much as I enjoy being able to carry lots of pens, it's just not appropriate for Citizenship Day. And we want our clients to be able to very clearly see who the helpers are, and so that's going to be the ones who are all dressed up. Etiquette, please be on time, please don't leave early, uh, be respectful of cultures, race, languages, ages, um, you can see all kinds of Wonderful things at Citizenship Day because we have people from many different cultures coming. Um, and so you can see very different kinds of attire. Um, you can see cultural attire. You can hear many different kinds of languages. You will see all sorts of wonderful, weird, and fun stuff. 
um, please don't chew gum, please no profanity, and that one's sometimes hard for me, but even I'll do my best, but let's all be professional at Citizenship Day. Let's talk about sensitivity and multiculturalism. Again, you will see people from all walks of life at Citizenship Day, and so just do your best to be sensitive and not react in any way that might embarrass uh, or make people feel bad. Um, sometimes just laughing at something can make people feel very, very inferior, um, especially when they don't speak English as a first language. Um, even giggles when somebody's English isn't perfect just be, is, is, is sometimes offensive. And it's not intended, but that's a unfortunate consequence. And so you just want to be very careful and very sensitive to the people that are around you um, and realize that they are here to get help uh, and we are here to encourage them to receive that help and to be as positive as possible with regards to them pursuing citizenship and being able to pass the test. And so be sensitive. Um, don't be surprised if you see family members at Citizenship Day who speak for each other. You will see children speaking for parents. You will see parents speaking for their adult children. Um, you will see husbands attempting to speak for wives and vice versa, depending on the culture. Um, when you encounter those situations, just be aware that you need to speak with the client, that you should, you know, if you see that you are asking questions and this family member is trying to help and providing all the answers and the client isn't saying anything, you need to put a stop to that and just politely let them know, you know, I have to get answers directly from the client and not from you. you know, and if they need an interpreter, then let me know. Let's discuss the situation. Um, and you go from there. But just make sure that you are talking to the client. And there will be children. There will be hordes and hordes of children sometime. We have a child care area that hopefully some of you will volunteer for. Um, and we, again, culturally, the standards of child care can vary from culture to culture. There's some where it's OK uh, for you know, an 8, 9, 10-year-old child to be the caretaker and watcher of younger children. Um, and so just don't be surprised if you see children, lots of children. Things we've seen our clients' children do, they, the negative things we've seen is scream constantly during interviews, attempt to write on documents and walls with highlighters or anything that they can, uh, grab legs and drool. That was just one client and one of my students had that experience. That was different. I don't expect to see that at Citizenship Day, but you never know. Um, we've also seen them open doors for us. We've seen them clean up after appointments and we've seen them be impressively polite. And so I would expect to see uh, the positive and the negative and hopefully it'll just be fun. So let's go over the flow of Citizenship Day and what you guys will be doing. So there will be anywhere from 70 to 100 clients receiving various forms of assistance. Um, we have a plan and instructions to be followed by each and every volunteer at each station. Um, the instructions will be on a sheet at each station just so you know. Volunteers should try to stay at their particular stations as much as possible during their entire shift. You will be responsible for signing in and out on the day of the event for each shift to document your pro bono hours. You still have to document them in, simplic in simplicity, just so you know. The uh, documentation at Citizenship Day is to back them up in the event that it's necessary. Um, on Citizenship Day, everything will be broken up into stations, and each station has a specific job. Um, it's a little bit different this year, uh, and so it, it, we've just changed the stations a bit. Um, the flow this year is going to be a little simpler, we hope, because we're going to have all cases processed in the same way. Everyone will go through all the stations. We have the check-in station, the criminal background check, just a Lexus search, and that's just through public records. Be aware of that. Um, the N-400 prep with the attorneys, final review and copying, and then a checkout and pickup for study materials. There's also a child care area in the student lounge and a breakfast or lunch area. Um, every station, again, will have step-by-step -step instructions printed for you. Uh, and so please, on Citizenship Day, when you come for your shift, come a little bit early so that you can read through the instructions and be very familiar with what the steps are at your station so that things have a chance of flowing very smoothly. So every client will also have a Citizenship, yeah, citizenship Day passport. Um, every client gets a Citizenship Day passport, and that is just a it's cardstock passport that we create, and they go from station to station and get stickers in their passports. And once they've completed their passport, that is when they get their study materials. So there are two different kinds of clients that may come to Citizenship Day. We have mass intake clients. These are clients who came to our, um, our group pre-screening sessions. 
Um, these will be in red or blue files. These clients have been screened uh, at, ma at, a, at a mass intake, um, and so that means that that's as much as we've done, is we have met with them basically one time, we've reviewed some information. Um, if there have been any issues, we've attempted to contact them so they're prepared at Citizenship Day. Um, but we have not had a lengthy amount of um, exposure, not exposure, but we, ha we haven't spent a lot of time with them yet. And so these are the cases where <clears throat> you need to be a little bit more cautious when um, they're being reviewed and just make sure that details are fleshed out and that questions are answered correctly, that clients understand. These are just the ones that you have to be a little bit more careful with. Um, they also may need additional documents to be copied. And just so you know, the red files indicate someone who only speaks Spanish or prefers to speak Spanish. And again, we have clients who qualify for exceptions, and so that would be the ones who only speak Spanish and absolutely need and, and are allowed to have an interpreter. And then some who just prefer it for going through application preparation. Um, we may have some of our one-on-one -on -one clients, and so my students met with a number of clients before the mass intakes, and with many of these cases, as we've been able to, we have just filed them. Um, if we have any that have not been able to be completed, then they will come to Citizenship Day to get them completed. These will be cases in manila files uh, that have a lot already done. We've met with them, we've gotten a lot of information, we've done um, substantial amounts of research if necessary, um, and they're just missing little things and weren't able to get it to us in time to get it filed before Citizenship Day. Uh, so don't be surprised if you see some manila files that are thick um, and, been, and are pretty much ready to go. But they will still be processed the same way. They go through all the steps. I just want you familiar with the types of cases that we have. Uh, Walk-ins on Citizenship Day are going to be sent for pro bono referral, most likely. And that will be a Jacksonville area legal aid representative who will take applications for pro bono services. Um, so any walk-in who comes in will be routed to a pro bono referral because it is very risky to just take a walk-in and prepare a case, um, especially now. You want to make sure that it's safe for somebody to apply. That's our obligation as attorneys. Um, it's not our job to file something willy-nilly just because somebody wants them to. Um, and so we want to make sure that we protect cases from the beginning and that people are getting advice before it's filed. And that is why we are very cautious with walk-ins and we do not want them to just get processed at Citizenship Day. Um, they need to be screened. They need to have research done if there's any issues. And that is why they go for pro bono referral. So any walk-ins, pro bono referral, and that should be in room 250. If there's any changes, again, you need to pay attention to the instruction sheets because those are going to be detailed and that's going to explain exactly what the steps are. So station one is check-in. All you're going to do is check the client in, give them their file and their passport, um, and then you assign numbers for background checks. You write numbers on criminal background check sheets, and there's more detailed instructions for this at the station. I don't want to go into too much detail for this um, for any of these stations since this is just a general training. Um, so check-in, you're just checking them in, giving them a file, moving them on to the next station, and making sure that you're documenting that they made it here. So the background check, the goals of this station is complete a simple public records background check. Um, you're going to print results if there's something that comes up that is more than a regular traffic citation. A uh, regular traffic citation is not going to cause issues for citizenship and doesn't really need to be documented, documented. Um, if there is anything like a criminal traffic misdemeanor or criminal felony, absolutely needs to be printed and put in the file. Uh, if there's no issues, then you're just going to check something off on the background check form and nothing else will get printed and then you're going to get the client to the next station. Station three is the N-400 prep and that's with the attorneys. Um, so volunteers at this station, student volunteers, are going to be sitting with attorneys and helping them prepare applications with clients. Uh, and that means helping them go through the questionnaires that we have. They're going to be hand filling forms, um, getting forms that are necessary for attachments. Um, getting fee waiver forms, um, copying documents. Um, this is where you get to spend lots of time with hopefully some future mentors of yours. Station four is the final review and copy. Basically at this point the application should have been prepared and signed and reviewed by the attorney and the client and now people at this station, volunteers at this station, you are going to double check the file and the application, make sure it's in the proper order. Um, and the order is going to be, number one on top of any application is the payment, so a check or money order for $725, or it's the basis for a fee waiver, so you have the form and then the evidence under it. And then you have the actual application itself, the form N-400, any attachments to that form will go after that. 
There'll be a copy of the front and back of the green card. There'll be a copy of the Florida ID or driver's license. And then with most cases, but not all, there's going to be um, a copy of the first page of the 1040 for their tax return, sometimes one year, sometimes two. Um, we usually like to submit three if we can. But don't be surprised if sometimes that is missing. There's nothing wrong with an application that doesn't have the tax returns. After you make sure that the file's complete, you're going to copy the file for the, for the client, the application only. You do not copy the entire file. Please don't copy files. Anything that is stapled in files, that means you don't copy it. That means it doesn't get unstapled. There's no staple pullers to be pulled. Don't use them. If they come out somewhere, don't use them. Don't unstaple the files. Just leave them stapled. The things that you need to copy will be loose or paper clipped in the file. And so don't worry about needing to unstaple and copy entire files for a client. That is not necessary. The client needs an entire copy of the application only. Um, so you make two copies of the application. One is for the client, one is for the file. The original N-400 and the entire application packet is going to go in an envelope and that is your, you're going to put in the client's file and that goes into a ready box. Um, any unfinished applications or any that might require additional action afterwards or that you're just uncertain of can go in a separate box. And we'll have banker boxes at the station for that purpose. There are some clients who might be mailing applications at a later date, um, or we might be holding the file so that we can mail it for them soon after Citizenship Day if, it's, if they're just a few days, weeks, or a month or so shy of their uh, three months of being able to apply. Um, and we would have notes on the file. So just pay attention to notes on the file. Uh, and just make sure that you are only copying loose documents, only the application, do not copy entire files. It's a lot of waste of paper and a lot of waste of time. So once they are done with getting their application filed, you put a sticker in their passport, it's the last one they need, and then they're gonna go to Station 5 and they're going to show their passport to you volunteers who are Station 5 so they can get their study materials. And the study materials consist of flashcards for the vocabulary for reading and writing, uh, which I'm not really sure how those work sometimes. But uh, my favorite study guide is the Red Book, and that has all 100 questions for the history and civics, um, along with an explanation, so a little bit of education on why there's questions and answers. Um, and it has the reading and writing word banks. And so it's a complete study guide for the citizenship test. And we'll be handing those out at Citizenship Day. It's the last step. Um, good study materials. The clients really love them and they love their passports. So they will show you the passport. You hand them their study materials. They get to keep the passport as a little memento from us uh, for Citizenship Day. And then you, of course, congratulate them on taking this last step in their immigration journey because sometimes it can be very lengthy and this U.S. citizenship to some people can be just another thing that they're doing. To many people, it is a big, big deal. The daycare for children. The student lounge is gonna be used for daycare. Um, we'll need a few volunteers just to hang out with the kids, play with them, monitor them. Um, volunteers also need to make sure that nobody else enters or exits the child care area who is not a parent picking up or dropping off a child. Um, we will provide movies and toys and other fun things for them to do, but not color on walls. And uh, we're not against if any of you volunteers might be interested in child care. Uh, if you have a gaming console that you'd be interested in bringing, then we're not against having that there. <laughs> the kids have loved it in the past. We would ask that it would be something similar to, you know, like, we don't need uh, any of the military and very realistic fighting games at Citizenship Day. <laughs> We'd like things that would be appropriate for children under the age of you know, 10. So uh, if you are willing to do that, we would really appreciate it. If not, we will figure it out and just have plenty of activities for them and you. Providing lunch and breakfast. We usually provide some kind of breakfast and some kind of lunch, depending on how much help we have and depending on um, what is going to be most efficient. Uh, we may have just some light snacks and whatnot for breakfast. We may have donuts and coffee. Uh, we will see at that time. But usually with the volunteers for lunch, we need somebody to uh, run the grill and stuff if we do a hot dog Wednesday type lunch. Um, we may just go with pizza to keep it simple. We're not sure yet. And so we will let you know and we will ask for your help as needed. So clean up. The other thing that we do at the end of the day on Citizenship Day is cleaning up. And that's just making sure that we have gathered all of our documents, that we have all our files, that we're not leaving any kind of mess um, that anybody else has to clean up. Uh, and so we would appreciate if some of you could stick around and help us clean up and gather things and put them away. Uh, if you say that you're going to volunteer for a certain amount of time, please do the entire shift. 
Um, if you need to change your time commitment, just let me know within 24 hours of the event so that I can try and move some people around and make sure we have things covered. Um, I understand that sometimes things come up in your schedules and that's okay, but just let me know as soon as you can so that we make sure people are taken care of. And that's all I've got for you. Thank you for supporting Citizenship Day. I really do look forward to working with you on April 15th. I hope that you have a wonderful time. I hope that you get the wonderful feelings that I do out of Citizenship Day and out of helping people um, with applying for citizenship. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to email me, kroberts at fcsl.edu. And I'll see you on April 15th. Thank you very much.